Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining AFA's webinar, RSV, Asthma, and You, What You Need to Know This RSV Season. We have a wonderful program for you today. But before we dive in, I would love to tell you a little bit more about AFA and who we are. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation aims to be a trusted ally of the asthma and allergy communities. We are dedicated to saving lives and reducing the burden of these diseases through support, advocacy, education, and research. Without you, our community, we wouldn't be here. So thank you for everything you do for those everywhere with asthma and allergies. My name is Stacy, and I am the Public Health Manager here at AFA, and I am happy to be your host for the program. Your speaker, who you will meet in just a moment, is Dr. Nita Ogden. Finally, we have a staff member ensuring everything on the back end runs smoothly. Her name is Zulima, and she is our support center manager. Now, let's go over some house rules. Everyone's video and audio are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box on the bottom of your screen. All questions will be received through our chat and will be answered at the end of the presentation. So please ask as many as you would like. There will be resources posted in our chat as well and opportunities to participate in today's program through answering questions. So today we will be discussing RSV. We will learn what it is and who is affected by the disease we will explore signs and symptoms of contracting RSV. We will also explore the link between asthma and RSV, ways to prevent, ways to stop the spread, treat RSV will also be discussed. We will also touch on the new RSV vaccines and antibody treatments, as well as preparing a list of questions that you can bring to your doctor or healthcare provider's visit. Finally, we will have a wonderful time to connect to resources in a question and answer se session with Dr. Ogden. Now, let's meet our speaker, Dr. Ogden. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for you today. Dr. Ogden is a nationally recognized allergy, asthma, and immunology specialist. She is a dual board certified in allergy, immunology, and internal medicine. Dr. Ogden has extensive expertise in allergies, food allergy, skin disorder, asthma, breathing issues, acute and chronic sinus infections, and all facets of testing for these conditions. Nationally, Dr. Ogden is a member of the Medical Scientific Council of the Allergy and Asthma Foundation of America, a fellow of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She is a national expert in allergy immunology, internal medicine, and the coronavirus pandemic, contributing weekly to CBSN's COVID-19 coverage. A graduate of Yale University and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Dr. Austin completed her medical training in both internal medicine and a specialty fellowship in allergy and immunology. She is board certified by both the American Board of Allergy and Immunology and the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Ogden offers in-office testing, food, pollen, and other inhalant allergy tests, drug allergy tests, pulmonary function tests, and tests to evaluate chronic rash, dermatitis, sinusitis, among others. Dr. Anita Ogden is also the director of the Allergy, Asthma, and Sinus Center a private practice located in Edison, New Jersey. So we have a wonderful speaker for you today. As you can see, as we will be talking about RSV or what you may be more familiar with RSV. This section will cover the basic facts, the cause, the spread, what it looks like. But before we actually start, before we continue on, we want to hear from our audience. So let's start off with a polling question. RSV, what is it audience? Is it A, the common cold, B, a respiratory virus that only affects newborns, C, a respiratory virus that is not easily spread, 
or D, a respiratory virus that usually causes mild cold-like symptoms. Now, while our audience is casting their answer, I'm gonna bring Dr. Ogden in to talk for a couple of seconds on this question. Dr. Ogden, can you tell us how common is RSV during the winter months? Well, thank you so much, Stacy. It is so great to be here. Uh, it's really such a pleasure to speak with the AFA community about such a timely subject matter. And I'm so glad that we're talking about respiratory syncytial virus today and how common it is. In fact, it's a very common respiratory virus, um, very similar to the common cold, but in certain populations, it can take a different turn. And that's what we're gonna discuss more today. Wow, thank you so much. I am so glad you're here to share that. And it looks like our polling answers have come in and looks like the answer is D. So now I'm going to turn uh, the program over to you, Dr. Ogden, to take us away. And uh, let's hear a little bit more about RSV. Right, so respiratory syncytial virus, also known as RSV, it's actually a very common respiratory virus that usually causes mild cold-like symptoms. However, it can be dangerous for certain populations, especially babies, toddlers, and older adults, and we'll again explain why that is uh, throughout this presentation. It commonly occurs in winter months. So we're really on the precipice of the RSV season, and most people uh, can recover in a week or two but it can be serious in those certain populations. Infants and older adults, they're more likely to develop that severe RSV and need even hospitalization. And the leading cause of lower respiratory airway inflammation and infection in this population, especially infants and young children. So how is it spread? Okay, RSV can be very, very easily spread and contagious. Um, so we're talking about contacts and droplets. It's a virus. It enters our body through the typical portals of entry that any virus or infection does, eyes, nose, mouth, uh, and it can be passed through direct contact, like kissing, touching either a person or a contaminated surface. It can last on contaminated surfaces for hours. Um, also droplets from an infected cough, they can land on you or sneeze, um, and again, can survive for hours. These become fomites actually that contain the virus and, are, and can be on inanimate surfaces. Uh, again, lasting for hours on you or surfaces. And this is really why during that RSV season, uh, washing your hands is so utterly important. Same thing for any children that you may be taking care of. Um, because they honestly are always putting, we know, their hands in their mouths uh, so often and touching their face. So if someone who has RSV coughs or sneezes, those airborne droplets are very likely landing on you or around you, and this can lead to direct contact with the virus. Um, and then you may be contagious uh, even before you know it. Uh, if you are immunosuppressed, you can actually be contagious and shed the virus for up to four weeks, contagious for even three to four days, uh, up to eight days, even before you manifest symptoms. Uh, so that's a very important point as well. During the season, we're not always sure how uh, infectious somebody is. Um, so it's always good just to sort of be aware uh, that you're in the middle of the season, season um, keep track of what sort of the news and your public health environment is saying about what's on the rise and taking those necessary steps like using antibacterial products, washing your hands regularly, wearing a mask. Um, so how does RSV spread? We're talking about this and this picture actually is very, uh, like shares a very salient point. It's, it's very easy with children to shower them with hugs and kisses, but you really don't wanna do that with children that maybe you don't know or who aren't in your immediate family. Because again, these are all vectors uh, of infection spread and um, you, you don't always know who might be carrying RSV and then can spread it to more vulnerable people. I think we can go on to the next slide. Signs and symptoms. Okay, so let's look at the signs and symptoms of RSV. This can really vary depending on age. Um, the younger the child, the more concerned we are um, about what this virus is gonna do. 
And this has a lot to do with their anatomy and the size of their airways. They're just smaller and they get inflamed and obstructed faster. And this can lead to worsening symptoms. Even the nose, um, RSV is known for producing a ton of mucus and a lot of congestion. You can see in a baby or children under five, what we're gonna talk about right now, um, the nasal passages, which is where it first really manifests, can very quickly become blocked. And that can also impair breathing. So children under five, it may not be severe, at first, and this is one thing I often see in practice, uh, RSV can turn severe rather quickly. Um, and that means that they may not necessarily look in the first few days that sick. It may just be a runny nose, um, a cough, but this may all of this may progress to increasing congestion with nasal blockage, a cough that may progress to wheezing, difficulty breathing, um, more simple things, or just eating or drinking less. Also, when their nasal passages are blocked, it's harder to eat or drink. Uh, they may be cranky or moody, and it's very important to know that fever may or may not occur. I find that people often use and cling to fever as like you know, an obvious uh, sign of infection, and that's just simply not the case, especially when you're very young or very old. And that takes us to older adults. Um, older adults, you also want to be careful. They just tend to not have symptoms of infection many times. Um, so they may just mistake this as allergies or a cold and neglect that it might be something more serious and this can lead to uh, longer term complications of RSV like pneumonia and that lower respiratory tract infection. But again, we'll see cough, runny nose, shortness of breath, and even in older adults, more sinus and ear symptoms. We can go to the next slide. So, um, Again, we're just really keeping in mind that RSV can look and sound very different for each person and child. Infants may have the following sounds that we're gonna show in this video. Children up to five may have a cough or runny nose and adults may not have any visible symptoms, just reiterating those points. So again, here's a video clip that shows us what it sounds like uh, and looks like for babies who have RSV. It was developed separately by AstraZeneca and EFCNI. what that video is illustrating is how many different sort of symptoms can kind of come through in a baby in particular, starting with the nose to the chest with the cough, um, the ribs. Um, and I'm going to go into more of this right now in terms of severe cases and when you even seek, uh, you know, emergency help. Um, and so that really brings us to what are the signs of a severe illness. In severe cases, RSV infection can spread to uh, the lower respiratory tract causing pneumonia or bronchiolitis, which is again, inflammation of the small airways. And you're really paying attention to timing here. When we start talking about severity in these severe cases, um, this can occur around day two to three of the illness. And what you're sort of witnessing is now a cold that's going deeper into the chest and everything looks more severe. Um, now the small tubes of the lungs and the bronchioles are involved. And this is why in, in a baby, especially under five, it can, it can seem like very quickly it turns into this because these are such small anatomical spaces. Um, so you really wanna call your healthcare provider right away if you notice these symptoms. Uh, breathing uh, becomes short or shallow, shallow or rapid. Um, if you're noticing any pauses in breathing, which is also known as apnea, high fever, uh, cyanosis, which is blue or gray color to the skin, specifically around the lips and in the nail beds, um, severe or life-threatening infection can actually require a hospital stay. And in children under five, 
um, this is especially dramatic, um, and you can actually see, we're going to talk about it um, very soon more, but how uh, this leads to retractions and things that you can monitor at home, uh, specifically in terms of changes in their, their breathing. Um, on physical exam, we all also notice things like very noisy breathing, especially in RSV, um, called ronchi and wheezing, again, which is um, one of the hallmarks of asthma, can occur in RSV. In older adults, severe cases may look a little different. Uh, there may be fever, uh, severe cough, wheezing, rapid or difficulty breathing or cyanosis. Um, again, that cyanosis, that change in tissue culture, color is what you're looking for that grayish and bluish tinge. Uh, and for those of us with asthma, you can also experience worsening of severe asthma symptoms. So again, wheezing, cough, nocturnal cough is kind of that hallmark of worsening asthma symptoms. Again, chest tightness, trouble breathing, and this can persist even after they're taking their uh, quick relief medicine. So emergency sign is sort of what I was talking about in the last slide. And um, this is extremely important because again, these are signals that you need to seek help. You do not wanna wait or ever sit on these symptoms. This is when you're going to urgent care or your doctor or the emergency room. I really tell my patients uh, who, for whom they have newborns or children under the age of five are really that critical time, uh, less than 24 months, uh, when RSV might be an issue to have a sense of what is a normal respiratory rate for your baby. And just a general approximation is 30 to 50 breaths per minute. If you're seeing something more than this, especially when they're sleeping, that is definitely a sign of concern. You're also looking at how they are breathing. A sharp pulling in the collarbone or in the chest, the sternum or in the ribs, these are called retractions. Um, the other thing is nasal flaring, flaring. Are they widening their nos nostrils between breaths or making a grunting sound? Or again, is there are there periods of apnea where you're actually seeing no breathing? Um, is this accompanied with cyanosis, that bluish tinge. Now this is a sign that you know they're not uh, oxygenating well enough. These there's some of their extremities, um, and again extremes such as high fever. You know I've even instructed my patients to go on social media and YouTube, Instagram. They're actually great examples of this. Uh, people involved either parents or healthcare professionals who do a really good what good job of documenting what this looks like and revisit it often so you're not missing anything. Um, in older adults, again, it can look different. Um, maybe a cough that worsens or doesn't go away, uh, that nocturnal cough that's keeping you up at night, shortness of breath, fever, wheezing, and again, cyanosis, all things to think about in older adults as well. And in people with asthma, um, these are very similar syndromes. So a cough that doesn't go away, difficulty breathing, wheezing, that noisy breathing, which I called bronchi, which we often notice on physical exam as doctors, um, chest tightness, uh, feeling like you just cannot get in a good deep breath. Um, and then again, feeling like your usual medications are not working. So RSV and asthma. <clears throat> And now that we know the sort of the signs and symptoms, it's a really good idea to talk about the two of them together. I first want to talk a little bit about who is at more, most risk for contracting RSV and what are the risk factors here. And really at the top of the list here are children. And the younger the child, the higher the risk. And then also older adults. And this is really connected to, yes, like I said before, anatomy for the youngest children, but also the developing immune system and the aging immune system and how uh, much more difficult it can be to clear viruses and how much easier it is to contract a virus. So you may be at high risk for contracting RSV if in either of these populations you live with chronic lung and heart conditions such as asthma, COPD, congestive heart failure, and all of these can get worse as a result of an RSV infection um, because it, it causes damage and inflammation to the lung tissue and therefore affects lung function. Also, people with weakened immune systems are also affected by RSV or anyone on immunosuppressive medications. Um, other things to think about in children under five years old, if they're premature, infants younger than 12 months, children younger than two with other conditions such as chronic lung or heart disease or weakened immune systems, neuromuscular disorders, uh, which can lead to difficulty swallowing or clearing mucus, 
having an older sibling, of course, is going to put them at more risk uh, in attending daycare because these are ways that you can easily contract the virus. Um, in older adults, we're looking at adults who are over 60. Again, chronic heart or lung disease, weakened immune systems, underlying medical conditions, um, variety of kinds, uh, even diabetes, for example, uh, living in nursing or long-term care homes. Again, all can lead to increased risk. And in people with asthma, you see RSV uh, increasing the risk of being hospitalized. Uh, they can also, RSV can worsen your asthma symptoms and increase asthma exacerbations. I think it's really important to highlight um, disparities in terms of asthma and RSV because health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health, and they're really experienced by socially uh, disadvantaged populations. Uh, common examples of diseases with disparities include asthma, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, heart disease. So these are the most chronic conditions that we see in the United States. Um, there are many disparities that exist uh, for asthma and RSV, RSV, so it's important to really work every day to uh, generate awareness around these and in that way create supportive care, uh, treatment access, and affordability and equitability to all communities. Um, and here is a great slide that is, uh, you know, really showing us how disparities can further compound the issue of RSV and asthma um, affecting Black Hispanic and indigenous people. And this is again why increasing accessibility to resources and education is uh, a priority. But we definitely see that in these groups, there is a much higher incidence of having diseases like asthma, going to the emergency room, and even death. So how does RSV affect people with respiratory diseases? Well. Exposure to RSV can negatively impact people with all forms of respiratory disease. Uh, people with severe or uncontrolled asthma really have very high risk. And, you know, there's actually a recent study uh, that shows that asthma, people with asthma have reduced viral clearance. So this, just that, immunologically, they're put at higher risk for contracting and having prolonged course of uh, infections like RSV. Uh, so this really highlights why it's so important to manage asthma and maintain control uh, so that you can reduce your doctor visits and hospital stays, uh, the cost of your medications. Um, and then other respiratory, other diseases that can get worse with respiratory infections include COPD, bronchiolitis at baseline, emphysema, um, for example, which are also very common diseases in the United States. Next slide. So RSV and asthma. Okay, so viruses are really one of the most common triggers of asthma. Um, COVID-19, we know influenza, just even rhinovirus, RSV. Um, and they really can cause flare-ups or exacerbations of asthma and lead to these increased visits to outpatient clinics, the emergency room, even hospitalization. So one of the most important things is to really understand the early warning signs and symptoms of an asthma flare. And, and then tied to that, knowing what to do right away, especially when asthma is about to go from okay to not okay to even worse, having your medicine on hand, making sure it's not expired, knowing how and when to use your quick relief medication, um, and then using an asthma action plan. And so really good asthma control is really, really key here, and these prevention me measures. Uh, one of the things that I feel is the most important thing I leave my patients with every time they see me in the fall, in the winter, like right in this time of the season is writing down for them again and again, what do you do with the first sign of the flare so that they understand and them even saying it, they having them say it back to me. and. Since so many of these patients are children, um, getting that communication across is highly important. Um, making sure that families are sharing it with uh, educators at school, school nurses, uh, coaches, so that they can sort of be aware when things are taking a turn as well. So there are three main changes to the airways that we see with asthma. First, asthma causes inflammation and overproduction of mucus in the airways. This in turn causes the airways to become hypersensitive, which makes the muscles around the airway spasm, and this is known as bronchospasm. 
Uh, so this inflammation and overproduction of mucus and bronchospasm causes the airways to narrow and can lead to asthma symptoms, which again can be any combination of cough, uh, that classic nocturnal cough, nighttime cough, uh, wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, even chest pain. Um, and again, asthma can be managed by avoiding asthma triggers. So it's definitely helpful taking medicines uh, to prevent and control symptoms and then treating asthma flares and episodes if they occur. So if you have RSV and asthma, there are a few things that you should do. First of all, don't panic. Um, it's really important to follow your asthma action plan, um, get your healthcare provider involved um, and start that early because it's always like a Friday afternoon when something's going on, know who's on call, try to just in this season have a sense of what you can do um, if an emergency with RSV or even if RSV just hits you and get started, what are the steps in place um, with your healthcare provider and with your medication. And obviously take your asthma medication as prescribed. Um, so we're gonna get more into this, um, but it's really important here again, how do we know when we have RSV and what those severe symptoms are? So the impact of RSV. Um, let's do a little bit of a look into how many people are affected by RSV each year um, and those statistics. Uh, so the RSV season um, usually strikes uh, in the fall, peaks in the winter. Um, the onset is from about mid-September to mid-November, and then it peaks in December and February, uh, ends around spring. Um, it's important to remember though, that in Florida, they have an earlier RSV season. Um, so they begin earlier, uh, can sometimes have a longer duration. All right, so we're gonna let Dr. Ogden rejoin us. Um, it seems as though we might have a little bumpy connection there. So I'm just gonna keep going with the program and let her sign back in and then we'll take her as we come. So um, is there an RSV season? Absolutely there is. Uh, RSV season in the US usually starts during the fall and peaks in the winter. The onset usually is from mid-September to mid-November and um, it peaks around February and ends around April. And like Dr. Ogden was saying, Florida ironically has an earlier RSV season beginning and having a longer duration than other parts of the U.S. Um, so it's very different across the U.S. and you might start to see some of those peaks starting now if you live in the southeastern part of the country and you might start to see it um, uh, go circulating around daycares or schools or things like that in your community if you're in other parts of the country as well. So it's important to know that RSV is a common virus and it usually causes mild cold-like symptoms. So sometimes it can be confused with a cold. Um, however, as Dr. Ogden says, um, it can take a quick turn and can be dangerous for babies, toddlers, and older adults. Um, so when we're talking about the impact of RSV, we know that in each year in the United States, about 1 million visits to healthcare providers um, happen and occur among children under the age of five. That is a lot of visits to healthcare providers and a big burden on our healthcare systems across the country. So that prevention and that treatment she was referring to is very, very important. We have 58,000 to 80,000 hospitalizations among children younger than five years old. There are 100 to 300 deaths. Um, each year in children younger than five years because of RSV. And in older adults, adults 65 and older, we see 60,000 to 160,000 hospitalizations each year, and even 6,000 to 10,000 deaths among those 65 years and older. So when we talk about the ability of the disease, the illness to spread rather quickly. This is what we're referring to and the importance of taking those prevention methods like hand washing and, um, and things like that. They are so very important. So as we move on and we see the impact of COVID-19 on RSV, before 2020, RSV had a very specific pattern in the United States. But since COVID, those patterns have become interrupted. And you can see here on this graph that in 2021, RSV began in the spring of 21 and peaked in July. So it really shifted that whole pattern 
of how and seasonality of how RSV occurred and where it occurred and how common it was in different communities. And COVID really put a disruption in that. And it's really too soon uh, to predict when or if the predictability of the illness will return. So there's a lot of variation there. Um, and it's really interesting to see and watch. And that's, again, why it's so important to talk about those prevention methods and those treatment methods and things like that. So I think Dr. Ogden is back. Hi, Dr. I'm Ogden. Oh, so sorry. I, power so outage. I know. I'm really sorry. Random power outage. That was very odd. I apologize for that. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm back. That's and it didn't look great. Like I didn't That's miss okay. Me. We're so glad to have you back. We just touched on the seasonality of RSV. I talked about the impact in the, this graph right here. And yeah. we can move on uh, to the, our RSV and asthma link. Man, just in time. This is your expertise. Take it away. Right. Well, so we um, definitely know that there is a link between RSV and asthma. And certainly while there isn't one reason that's been shown to be the cause, it's more likely multifactorial. Um, so studies have really shown um, the following as linked to asthma development. Uh, later in life, you know, especially when it hits in infancy. So RSV infection in the first year of life, that's uh, really been now elucidated. There was a recent study out of Vanderbilt that uh, very much highlighted this connection. Also, um, more severe infection, especially in those that very, very young age group, and the immune responses that we see in infancy. They can be aberrant immune responses, uh, but they're also specifically immune responses that then move that infant response towards what we call more Th2 or allergic arm. Um, genetic influences. We also see this affecting the development of asthma and allergy parental ATP or that like presence of an allergy disposition and asthma can lead to you know this connection between the two environmental factors c-section birth weight passive smoke exposure and then co-infection with other viruses like that rhinovirus or even having colonization with um, strep pneumo which is the respiratory microbiome um, anatomy uh, we talked about that small sort of airways of infants, uh, but we're really seeing um, the cellular inflammatory groundwork that's so similar to asthma, actually, that gets laid by that early RSV infection. So these are all things that can sort of uh, be linked, cause that linkage between RSV and asthma. Um, you know, on a more practical level, we can go to the next slide about getting a diagnosis. So, you know, getting a diagnosis RSV is very much a clinical diagnosis, to be honest. Um, and you know, if you think you or someone you love, older or younger, has RSV, you may want to visit your healthcare provider. Um, this may be in the office or it could be a telehealth visit. Um, but things that they might do, they will do a physical. Um, recent medical history, take a clinical history. So they're looking at how you sound, clinical history, was someone sick at home? Again, that older sibling that may be uh, a cause of exposure or daycare, like I mentioned. Um, and then assessing that exposure is really key. Listening to chest and lungs, we're looking for that noisy breathing, ronker sound, um, wheezing. Um, they may do things like uh, checking your pulse oximetry, uh, even pulmonary function tests. Uh, if they're old enough, obviously babies are not gonna do anything like this, but an older child might. Um, and then depending on the severity and what they're thinking of, if it, pneumonia, for example, is an issue that they might you know, be worried about, uh, a chest x-ray might happen, possibly in the office or urgent care. That takes us to getting a diagnosis. Um, so there are other tests that can be performed as well to test for RSV. Um, and the lab tests, there's a, a PCR test. Now this is usually done in hospitals and this often has a longer turnaround. Honestly, this is useful in terms of establishing the diagnosis, but at this point, if you're in the hospital, it's not necessarily gonna change immediate care because it can take time to come back. Um, so that's, again, how RSV often is a clinical diagnosis first. Uh, then there are rapid antigen tests as well. You know, doctor's offices I, I have found don't always have these, but they can be performed in 30 minutes or less. You do have to be careful of false negatives. Again, putting the um, burden on the, that clinical diagnosis and the physical exam and acting on that more than anything. Treatment and management. 
So um, let's talk about ways that you can sort of protect yourself and other people in the next slide. Um, there are measures that you can take to ensure that you're protecting um, yourself and loved ones from RSV. And these are very like things that we talk about, but we don't always practice as religiously as we should. I think in this season is washing your hands often and uh, definitely uh, trying to do the same for uh, your children, especially if they're not old enough to do it on their own. Avoid touching your face, uh, avoid close contact with sick people. So really just touching base with people before uh, large gatherings and sort of trying to get a sense of, you know, if anyone is sick, covering your cough and sneeze using, you know, the crook of your elbow or your arm rather than your hand. Um, cleaning frequently touch surfaces and staying home if you're sick. So protecting yourself again. Um, this really brings us to uh, what's what's in the news right now a lot and so exciting about um, RSV at this time. Uh, older adults, 60 and older, can receive a single dose of the new RSV vaccine. Um, vaccines and immunizations are also available for infants, older babies, and pregnant people. Um, so it's a pretty exciting time because this these these modalities of treatment, at least in studies, have shown a dramatic reduction in severity of disease and hospitalizations. And that really brings up the point of just how do you treat RSV? Um, so again, this is a virus, so we're not starting antibiotics. Um, so we're really doing supportive care and a lot of monitoring. Um, if there's fever, you want to manage uh, your fever with antipyretics and also pain if you're having aches. Um, drinking fluids is huge. Hydration is so, so important. And in babies, this is something you actually want to monitor by looking at wet diapers. Are they drinking enough? That fussiness, that inability to get liquids down if they're very congested can really affect um, hydration and just the hydration part of this can land uh, a child in the hospital. Um, using nasal saline drops or misty shower, for example, um, this is a great way to also help loosen up mucus um, and a great supportive measure that you can use at home. Um, also a humidifier at the bedside. Nasal suction, there are nasal suction treatments. There's so much mucus that is produced during RSV leading to such intense conge congestion. Um, nasal suction devices are really, really excellent, especially when obviously babies can't clear it on their own. Staying in touch with your healthcare provider, again, Who's on call that weekend? What do you do for an emergency? And then that takes us to what if you have asthma? Having your asthma action plan, your medicines ready to go, um, making sure things aren't expired, and really knowing what to do when things take that downward turn. So our next polling question, we're gonna hear from our audience again. Um, RSV vaccines are available now, so we want to um, get your thoughts on getting the vaccine. Um, RSV vaccinations are available, your thoughts. Uh, A, I'm hesitant about giving my child the RSV vaccine. B, I wanna get the RSV vaccine. C, I do not wanna get the RSV vaccine. And D, the vaccine is new. I would like to see more research before I make a decision. I'd love to just sort of get people's thoughts here and um, what they, so that's interesting. More research is needed. Um, oh, no, nope. I want to get the RSV vaccine. So sort of tied, tied with more research is needed before I make a decision. And I think that's, that's pretty appropriate for um, this vaccine being new and, um, and potentially life-saving. Moving on. Vaccines. So let's talk a little bit about the vaccines right now. Um, the vaccines, there are two types of vaccines that both protect from RSV. Um, and this is for adults uh, six years and older, again, protecting them from severe illness. Uh, the older adults are at greater risk than young adults for serious complications because of, again, what we call immunosenescence or that immune decline that we see that happens with age. And it's interesting because as we become you know, people live longer at age 60, they may not perceive themselves to be experiencing that kind of change in their immune system, but it's still very important to be aware that that happens and that they could be at risk for RSV infection. Um, so that's one thing in terms of older people. Now, the next slide, we can talk about 
treating and preventing it in toddlers and adults. So now the RSV vaccine is really not for children or infants. We're talking about giving it to pregnant people um, between 32 and 36 weeks during RSV season so that that immunity is then going to be passed on to the child when they are born. Um, there's also something called RSV antibody immunization, which is a monoclonal antibody that's given to babies younger than eight months and born during or entering their first RSV season. Um, and this can also be given later in an older uh, baby, less than 24 months if they're still at high risk in a second season. Um, so these are the basically the two things that we're talking about that are new the vaccine for older people, the vaccine for pregnant people, and RSV antibody immunization with a monoclonal antibody. And sort of the next slide um, talks about these new immunizations. Again, sort of summarizes exactly what we're talking about. Um, adults over 60 would be getting an RSV vaccine. Is it for everyone? This is something you talk about with your doctor first and, and sort of make a shared decision-making um, process to see if this is for you. Um, for babies, again, there are really two modalities here. And um, it, it's basically recommended that a baby who is entering or born during RSV season uh, would not actually need both. Um, so it's either an antibody, a monoclonal antibody, um, or the vaccine that's given during pregnancy, which then they get that passive immunity from the mother. So RSV flu, COVID-19 vaccines, can I take them at the same time? A super common question, a great question. And the answer is yes, you can. But it's not necessarily set in stone that that's what you're supposed to do. This is really something you want to think about what's best for you and your family. Um, I honestly don't recommend doing all three at once, except if it's you absolutely won't be able to make time to go back uh, and get them separately because it is a lot, um, especially if you're an older adult, uh, to take on just from an immune point of view. Um, and in fact, some studies have shown that doing the vaccines all together can lead to a, a, a slightly reduced immune response. Um, so there is no harm in doing them together. You can definitely do them together. And you also wanna take into account the seasonality what is sort of circulating, what's the timing if you can get a sense of, you know, RSV and flu in your area, um, because timing helps in terms of the antibodies and um, greatest protection. Um, so it is okay to break them into separate times as well. And um, it helps, they all have mild side effects. Maybe some people may not experience that, but they can where you can feel achy, uh, soreness. So separating them can also minimize those effects. Um, the important thing is really remember we now have these tools in our to toolbox to help prevent these illnesses. And for the first time we can take action, they really can play a part in our healthcare. It's a great slide that again sort of expands upon uh, flu, COVID-19, and RSV vaccines. Um, and at this point, um, we're talking about also who should be getting them. Um, everyone six months and older should really be getting an updated flu vaccine um, and people 65 and older as well. Um, and really, I have found in my clinical practice, for sure, the flu vaccine reduces um, severity of illness. Uh, getting full-blown influenza is miserable, even if you don't have concurrent illnesses. And you add asthma or any other kind of underlying diabetes, uh, COPD, congestive heart failure, something on top of that, and it can really, and old age, can certainly be something that can lead to much more severe outcomes. I recommend all of my patients over six months of age without a doubt get the flu vaccine every year. Um, COVID-19, um, so again, this is for people six months and older, get the updated vaccine. And I think that this is something that, um, again, we've seen, especially for older patients, um, that it can make a huge difference in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality from infection. So it's something important to talk about with pediatricians and your healthcare providers. And then 
it's again this great review of what is available to us for RSV, um, just awareness that these things are available. Um, the most vulnerable people should be considering these things um, and should have a discussion with their with their healthcare provider about them. That is really the biggest takeaway point here because it can make a huge difference. So questions to ask your doctor. Um, you really want to know, like, how does things change for you if you get RSV in terms of your asthma? Um, and really, what are the emergency signs of RSV if they're severe? So you want to go through sort of a plan with your with your doctor about what happens. Um, again, one thing I love is for patients to really bring their questions with uh, them to any of these check checkups. Make a list, write it down, even um, text it in your phone. We quickly go through these at the visit. But like, for example, what do you do about changing your medication when you're hit by RSV or any virus for that matter? Um, and then when should you call your healthcare provider? Uh, when does testing come into play? Um, when do you wear a mask? And again, should you get the vaccine? So every healthcare provider's approach might be different, um, but it's really important that you just get these questions out there and address those concerns. So next, this is our last polling question. Um, I'd love to test your knowledge here. Um, RSV vaccines are available for A, everyone, B, older adults, C, infants and pregnant people, or D, both B and C. I know we covered a lot of information, um, so hopefully this won't be too much of a stump. Great, here I am, both B and C. Amazing. I'm so impressed. Um, thank you for those of you who took the polling question. It, you definitely were paying attention and I think you're going to tackle RSV season. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Ogden. What an amazing and incredible presentation. Thank you for diving into this feat first and thank you to our audience for participating with us throughout the entirety of the presentation and really staying with us through those little bumpy parts where we lost a connection and jumping back in when Dr. Ogden came on board. We did not miss a beat, so I'm glad we did that together. We, this is a wonderful resource list of all the things that AFA has to offer. So we have our store at afa.org backslash store, and we have all kinds of educational materials, handouts, um, all kinds of things about our certified products or asthma action plan even. You can find one on that site. I encourage you to go to that site and look through those resources and really print them out. Take them to your next doctor's visit if you don't have an asthma action plan go here right after this program, get that action plan, print it out and make an appointment to go see your doctor and um, have that today. That is one fabulous resource. We also have our support center, which you will meet Zulima in just a few minutes. Um, she manages that support center and you can find her at 1-800-7-ASTHMA. If you have questions or concerns or anything about asthma or allergies, you can call that number and reach someone on the other end. We also have our online communities, which is absolutely fabulous for connecting with one another and creating a community together, right? It's important that we stick together and we learn so much from each other, from our families, from our friends, from all of us in our community. And this is one way you can do that is by following um, these points right here. We also have a really great learning catalog and an Ask the Allergist area as well. So thank you guys so much for joining us in this. Now it's time for our Q&A portion of the program. So Zulima and Dr. Ogden, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys for any questions that have come in uh, during and come in before the program. So Zulima, take it away with our first question. Hi everyone, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the Q&A session. So our first question is, uh, can I get RSV a second time if I just got it three to six months ago? Yes, unfortunately you can. And the more sort of risk factors you have to contract illness or RSV, the more likely it is. Unfortunately, RSV is not necessarily like a one and done, you have immunity to it um, infection. So, um, it, it can occur. Um, that is a pretty short time span though, but it can occur. Um, you know, and it is 
if it, it's something that's, uh, for example, you're sicker than before or you're not getting better, it's really worth getting tested at that point and um, seeking help from your healthcare provider. But it is good to know that uh, RSV does not lead to uh, immunity, which is why we really had to develop these vaccines as well for the older population. Okay, our next question is, what are the differences between asthma symptoms and RSV symptoms? Yeah, so ours, they're very similar um, in terms because of there's that inflammation happening in the bronchioles and the um, airways, but asthma symptoms, RSV symptoms are going to appear sicker. You will appear sicker. And so it's almost like you're taking your asthma and now adding, you know, some fuel to the fire so that it flares. And now you're combating a, a cold that is now going into lower airways and adding more inflammation on top of uh, existing asthma. So take your asthma and make it much, much worse. The other thing with asthma, uh, with RSV, I mentioned earlier, a lot of mucus. You're very congested in the nose. You're producing a lot of just, to just say it, it's not. Um, especially in children. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of secretions that you may not see otherwise in asthma at baseline. Fever, again, infectious symptoms, um, achiness, uh, just that unwell feeling that again, you might not just see if, you, if you're combat combating your regular asthma. Our next question is, how often is an RSV vaccination recommended for adults with asthma and allergies? Um, so this includes um, the MCAS, idiopathic anaphylaxis. Um, so um, that's the question. Yeah, so um, the RSV vaccination for adults um, is supposed to last two seasons. Uh, so you probably won't need it for uh, you get it once and then it's basically lasting you for two winter seasons. Uh, but this is something that sort of the CDC and FDA is also going to watch and observe in terms of recommendations on how often they should be getting it. But that's how often um, people should be getting it in terms of those diseases that you're mentioning. Um, idiopathic anaphylaxis, mast cell diseases, um, it really, you know, those are a little different in terms of um, allergies and asthma because asthma has that uh, airway involvement um, that's always ongoing and silently there. So I would talk to your healthcare provider so that you could just have a better understanding because if any of those medication wise or how it's manifesting in you has led to for example immunosuppression or changes in your immune system, um, it may be that you fall into the category of someone who needs the RSV vaccination. How does RSV impact adults over 65 and how does one get RSV as an adult? So what we were talking about in the presentation about immunosenescence and the declining immune system that we start seeing in older age, um, it means that it is harder to fend off any kind of virus um, and that's why RSV impacts those older adults more severely um, and people who are adults get RSV um, the same way that everyone else does it's basically through contact um, and through surfaces that might have those infected fomites so touching surfaces or having droplets land on you and then they enter those portals of entry the mouth nose um, and breathing it in. So older adults, for example, grandparents, they really want to be cautious around, you know, that we used to have that slide with the picture, the affection around young children, because they may be carriers. You may not be aware that you're interacting with an infectious, contagious person. Our next question is, are seniors with asthma more at risk of getting RSV? Yes, they are um, for two reasons. One, uh, we have the seniors with, as we've mentioned, that sort of declining immune system. So that means you just don't have the same strong defense, defenses, immune defenses against any type of infection. And then we know that at asthma, as I mentioned before, you have 
you know, decreased viral clearance. Um, you also just have baseline uh, and inflammatory response going on um, that can also make it much more difficult to clear a virus. So these things together make you more at risk. Our next question is, are there programs that can help cover the cost of RSV vaccine if it is not covered by private insurance, Medicaid, or Medicare? So some insurance companies do cover it, some do not cover it at all. So it's a shot that's recommended by the CDC, which means private insurance can cover for some without offering a copay. So check with your insurance about coverage for the vaccine before you make an appointment. You also wanna check with local health centers or state health departments to see if they offer RSV vaccines at no cost or a sliding scale or a minimal copay. These health centers uh, receive the same, same shot dose as everyone else. They just make it more accessible for everyone. Um, <clears throat> coverage is dependent on what insurance you have and what plan you have. If you have Medicare Part D, um, the drug benefit plan, it should be available free of charge. If you are told otherwise, um, you know, when you go get the vaccine, call 1-800-MEDICARE for assistance. But certain vaccines may be covered or available at lower out-of-pocket costs in Medicare Part D, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program or other consumer plans um, through the Inflation Reduction Act. That's great advice and information. Um, our next question, why is there no vaccine for older children? Yeah, so for older children, for the most part, um, it's not always pleasant to get RSV, but they will clear it. You know, they tend to have that immune fortitude, you know, that they can clear viruses and infections, and they're not in that at-risk category where they're either too young or too old, uh, which causes that immune vulnerability. And also when you're very, very young infant, those very small airway passages. So uh, at this time, there's, there's really no need. They tend to have RSV and clear it and move on. Our next question is, my child's daycare doesn't have an RSV policy. What should I do? Yeah, it's a great question. So some daycares are required to have policies. Um, it's not dependent or required from them necessarily, but they are, some of them are um, required to have policies. So bring your questions to the director, share your thoughts if there isn't a strict policy in place um, on the importance of having a policy, knowing um, when there has been an RSV exposure in the center. I mean, that is really, really key, um, even more so sometimes if there's a sibling at home um, who, or a family member at home who has RSV uh, of the child who's in daycare. Um, that way everyone can sort of be prepared uh, and take preventive measures uh, ahead of time. Yes, absolutely. Our next question is, if my child has RSV, when are they okay to go back to school? Such a good question, and these are such great questions. I think it's um, so important to know this because um, you never want to send them back too soon, obviously. So they really should be fever-free uh, for 24 hours. They haven't had a fever or needed any medication to lower the fever. Um, some schools may even say 48 hours, but 24 hours is usually the standard. And then, you know, think of it like if they're needing let's say they have RSV and asthma and they're needing uh, medication at home, uh, such as, you know, a fast acting um, um, bronchodilator, like an albuterol or Ventolin. Um, this is, if this is happening at home, you want to wait to send them back to school because that may not be in place there. Um, and they may not be just better. Um, so you want to wait until basically you, they're not needing the kind of care at home um, and they could basically go to school where they're not going to necessarily get those interventions. Okay, and with that, that concludes our question and answer session. Dr. Ogden, I'll hand it back to you so that you could close us out for today's webinar. Well, thank you so much again to um, everyone who helped organize this event, and especially to AFA for driving such awareness around a very important condition. Um, and especially at this time when we have the new vaccines and monoclonal antibody for those people who are most vulnerable. Uh, so I really, really thank you for creating this awareness and for everyone who attended uh, doing the same for your community.